Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of Office Hours. Today I have Erica Vincent with me. She is the Just Energy Manager. And I am Michael McMiller, the Student Youth Organizer with KTSE. Uh, today we're gonna be with you for about 25 to 30 minutes. And um, we're gonna just give, give get a broad stroke of youth leadership and PSC's Just Energy portfolio. Uh, hey, Erica. Hi, Mike. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So let's get right into it. Um, Erica, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So again, my name is Erica Vincent. I am originally from Newark, New Jersey, although I've spent first the first half of my childhood in San Diego, California. So I have a really good, interesting um, outlook on like perspectives from my childhood regarding like being from the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, but I consider myself from Jersey. I'm very much a Jersey girl. Uh, I currently live in Lithonia, Georgia, which is 30 minutes east of Atlanta. Uh, I am the Just Energy Manager at PSC. I've been here for about two and a half years. Uh, and uh, I love my job and love the work that we do in community. I love the work that we're trying to do when it comes to youth leadership. Uh, I am a graduate of Spelman College. I graduated in 2010 with a Comparative Women's Studies Bachelor's degree. And I see that work show up. I see that those studies show up a lot in my work. Some of my favorite classes, like social, women in social resistance movements. And so uh, I see that show up a lot in my work when it comes to the way that I approach the work, but also like the way that I see women in the work and like our community, the black community in the work as well, as black women really being the anchor of, um, of our community. And so uh, I have worked in various organizations, nonprofit work is my life and will continue to be. Uh, I need to be doing work that fuels my soul and all the work that I've done up until this point uh, has done that. Uh, I'm, not shy, you know shy or um, ashamed to say my age. I'll be 32 in August. I'm 31, and uh, it has been a great ride when it comes to like my career, which has spanned about 12 years now, um, mm -hmm. both from when I was in college, uh, starting around like 2008, and now being um, 31 years old, uh, heading you know being a manager at PSE um, and working. Uh, kind of leading a lot of this work that I have been passionate about since I started. Mm, mm, okay. So, so how did you enter the work? Like what made you interested or care for um, doing something for somebody else other than just trying to make some money? Yeah, that's a good question. So I've always been someone that was interested in like helping people. And I feel like that's a really, broad thing for folks to say and a lot of people say that all the time mm -hmm. but I think that uh, I wasn't really sure I wasn't really always sure how mm -hmm. I would do that and so a lot of when I first when I, when I was younger I wanted to be a lawyer and then I wanted to be a judge um you know people always ask little kids like what do they want to be when they grow up which I think is kind of an unfair question um, but uh, those were kind of my initial like helping people ideas or like being like a defense attorney or something like that. Mm -hmm. When I got to college, I realized I probably really didn't want to go to grad, <laughs> really didn't want to go to law school. I was like, I don't know about that. But uh, right around that time that I was kind of lost on what I wanted to do, you know, spirit, the universe, God, I mean, however you identify that tradition or yourself, uh, kind of through two opportunities for me to like find my niche at around the same time when I was switching my major from sociology mm -hmm. to comparative women's studies. And so around the same time that I was switching my major to women's studies, which women's studies is a required course at Spelman, women's studies or international relations, and I chose to take intro women's studies. So right around the time where I was switching my major because I just loved it mm -hmm. uh, and loved learning about it, um, I joined uh, a... Uh, student organization called SEED, which is actually chartered at Morehouse's camp, or was chartered, it no longer exists, but was chartered on Morehouse's campus. And I joined SEED uh, around the same time. And it was really cool because those two pieces kind of coalesced for me when it comes to uh, like Black women in the work, women in the work, um, feminism, womanism, 
and then also like environmental justice, social justice from that standpoint and from that lens. And so they both came together in my life. I guess this is like the first time I'm really realizing they all came together in my life at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to find my niche. And so I was like, you know, 19, 20, when I was figuring that all out in college and still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And it was interesting because my mom was like, oh, you're changing your major. Like, what are you going to do with that? And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> um, which made her, which was not, made her kind of nervous. Um, I think she's fine now, but, but in the beginning, I think it shocked her. Um, I really didn't know, but I knew I wanted to like do something that I was really passionate about. Mm-hmm. And, that, and I was passionate about helping people, like passionate about justice. I always have been. Uh, and that is um, generational for me. My mom was involved in the student uprising and uh, demonstrations and when she was in high school in Newark. Uh, and so it's like a, it's like in my blood. Uh, mm. My uncle went to the Peace Corps, so like it's definitely in my blood to like do work for other people and like be involved in community and stuff. So I've always been interested in that and uh, have continued to like move in that space even after college. Oh, cool, cool. Okay, so what age did you really start to see yourself as a leader? Like not just leadership as a professional, but just moving people towards a certain direction? Well, if you ask my fourth grade teacher, uh, she'll say like Erica's a leader. She would say like Miss Barry, she would say like Erica's a leader, but she might talk too much. Um, So (laughs) I think I've oftentimes been called that and didn't really know exactly what that meant. And Mm -hmm. it could have meant something different for different people. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh learning how to like channel my energy so i'm an extrovert extroverted extrovert like very much so (laughs) so learning how to channel my energy in a way that can be really impactful and powerful and like make other people feel powerful or build power with other people i don't like to say empower because people already have their power so i'm like giving them any but really like helping them realize their own power is something that really just like feeds and fuels my soul. It is the work that my soul must have. Uh, That is a direct quote from Reverend Dr. Katie G. Cannon. The work my soul must have is the work I do at this Mm -hmm. time. Um, And it just like fuels me. So like what age, I think I've always seen myself as leader because I've been described that way in my report cards and progress reports when I was in school, even though I didn't know what that means and it could have meant different connotations. Uh, But how, when did I realize like I could utilize my personality and my leadership for good, I think was definitely probably in in like high school. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm always been involved in performing arts as well i've been i have been dancing and singing since i was three or four years old and in high school i was in theater uh so if you're you know like someone who does theater or enjoys performing arts you know that like the the ability to make people see power in a visual way or the ability to like inspire people is really a large portion of what not just entertainment but a large portion of what the performing arts is about and mm-hmm. that is uh something that's really near and dear to me and a, a huge part of my history as a person and so i think that's where probably in high school and doing like stage plays and recitals and stuff is probably where i saw it where i was hopefully really like inspiring people or making them feel something mm-hmm. and so i think that's a huge part of leadership is invoking feelings in people that helps them realize their own leadership Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully can help them build it in their own minds and if you're a leader if you're a quote-unquote a leader that's not doing leadership development or helping people pull themselves up into those positions then i would argue to say like you're not you're not as effective as you could be so let's dig let's dig really quickly yeah um i saw a post on instagram that said it's funny that the the lady young ladies who used to get in trouble in elementary school for talking too much ended up being the lawyers and the doctors and the such and right. such and such. When you think about ecofeminism and when you think about being a black woman leader, especially in, in stuff about marginalized people, 
how do you navigate that? I mean, you're you're at a very strong and powerful organization, and you're holding a, a position in the helm. And actually, at this organization, there's a ton of women holding yeah, very yeah. powerful positions. For the all the young black women out there, how do you navigate that? How do you uh, stay assertive and, and keep kind of the waters cool? when people may not be accustomed to or for following a woman? That's a very good question. I saw that post on Instagram. I retweet, I reposted it. <laughs> yeah. because that, I was like, I, I was like, I identify. That was my main <laughs> thing. My progress report was Erica is really smart and she's a leader, but she talks too much. Uh, so yes, I absolutely agree with that. And that's a very good question. I think that You know, for not, not for all of us, for me, I'll speak about myself and then I'll like go to like kind of a broader conversation. But for me, I come from a line of matriarchs. So like my mom, my grandmother, my great grandmother, like really strong matriarchs. And not because, and I often say this to my family, like not because they had to, not because they wanted to, because they had to, like they were the foundation of their families. Like my grandmother, if she didn't do what she had to do like my aunts and uncles and my mom weren't going to eat and that's just like a fact mm -hmm. so I think that and I think my mom the same way of like having to having to be that and I think black women in general I hope a lot of people I hope people wouldn't dis disagree but like black women are the, an the anchor of the community and it is statistically proven that when you educate a woman you change the course of a community mm. um, that is global. That's not just in the mm. black community, that's global. Mm. And so I think that for me, you know, navigating that piece, I don't necessarily look, actually not necessarily, I do not seek to change people's minds on whether or not women can be leaders. I just mm -hmm. embody it the best way I can in myself as mm. a cisgendered woman. Mm -hmm. um, who identifies as female, you know, I, I am, I, I, I step into that space. I never really had um, meekness necessarily about stepping into that space just because of the women that were around me my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, honorable mention to my godmother as well, God rest her soul, Aunt Wanda, who definitely like showed that in her quiet leadership. So, like, I've seen in my life women who were, like, outward and boisterously leader, leaders, not in, like, a obnoxious way, but in, like, a commanding respect, even in the most respectful way. Mm -hmm. And then also seeing women who were silent leaders who, you know, may have been introverts and may have been kind of quiet, but walked into a room and you, you knew, you saw them and you knew that they were there and they didn't right. even have to say a word. So, I think navigating that is tough, can be really tough, especially for people that, don't see themselves following a woman as a leader, but being the most effective as you can in your work, be knowing that you are the subject matter expert in your work, but also mm -hmm. knowing when to like ask other women or ask other people for help, mm -hmm. um, I think is a strong leadership quality. And mm -hmm. so I also keep really strong women around me. I have really phenomenal mentors mm -hmm. and mothers in the movement who mm -hmm. I go to for those answers who are forces of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, keeping really strong women around me who are strong leaders in their own right, and also like not seeing being a strong woman as a negative, because I think that also oftentimes has a negative connotation, mm -hmm. but you can be a strong woman and demand the respect that you need in the most diplomatic way possible. Like my mom often says like, Erica, you're so diplomatic with the way that you <clears throat> tell people what it is <laughs> it's like sometimes it calls for that and sometimes it calls for you to like call people to the mat and say like I'm not going to tolerate this so I think finding the happy medium between those pieces can be hard but is necessary for women as leaders because you know not walking into a room or not being in a conversation where every time you saw every time you talk you start with sorry uh you know think simple things like that um you, you there's nothing you don't have anything to apologize for when it comes to interjecting and making your voice heard in a space mm -hmm. like that oftentimes a male dominated space oftentimes a cis male dominated space oftentimes a white male dominated space mm 
Um, and so, you know, you have nothing to apologize for. Or like, if you said something and someone came behind you and said the same exact thing and someone took that and was like, oh, that's a great idea. Speak up and say, that's what I just said. Like, yeah. don't let people take credit for your great, wonderful, powerful ideas. So I think being present is probably the best advice I have and showing up fully as yourself, whatever that self is. And if that is a black woman, um, I will not apologize for not choosing to be black or a woman. I am both and I show up as both in all of my identity. Um, mm -hmm. And so I encourage young women to do the same. Awesome. 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 Okay. So let's get into it. Um, why does PSC focus on energy? Uh, PSC focuses on energy equity and climate justice, I should say, like we do energy equity work, but also climate justice work in this portfolio. And we focus on energy equity because uh, climate and energy are one of the ways that people, that we see that people are uh, widely disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, uh, Nathaniel always talks about uh, the history of extreme extraction. Mm. So what does that mean? You know, extreme extraction, both from a space of extracting resources out of the ground mm -hmm. or other places in order to create energy and produce like the energy that we use to turn our lights on and power mm -hmm. our homes, but also the extreme extraction of energy from the energy of people. Mm. Uh, so when he says that, he's talking about uh, the history of uh, African peoples on this continent uh, and mm. the enslaving of African peoples uh, mm. who were extracted from the continent, from their own continent, and brought to uh, a world that they uh, did not recognize to uh, and uh, being extracted from their space to be the energy that powered this country. And we are doing the same by extracting resources from the ground and using that energy to power um, our world. And so I think that energy equity oh, is important for PSC because it is uh, powerful in the way that people uh, use it in their homes, are able to afford it in their homes. Energy is super expensive for a lot of people. Uh, and so hopefully we are, hopefully we are uh, educating people on where their energy comes from, but also, you know, and how that could potentially be harmful from a health standpoint, mm -hmm. but also where their energy comes from uh, or how their energy is utilized and how they're paying for it. So we do a lot of work on like rates and things like that as well and making sure people um, have the best knowledge and we're we're advocating for people from a um, uh, from a standpoint of like paying their energy bills is what I'm trying to say. So all of that is ways that inequities are very present in our communities. And so that's why PSC, uh, thinks that energy equity is important and has a whole portfolio and staff dedicated to that work. So, hypothetically, we we um, we get what we want. We want equity, um, and sometimes people view equity as uh, when marginalized people use equity, they they look they think that they're looking for a handout, and uh, I think we believe that it's not that way at all. Uh, so can you talk to us about the, mm -hmm. the principles of shared prosperity and how uh, reconciling and dealing with these issues actually helps everybody? So PSC has our principles of shared prosperity and each portfolio also has values that we follow in our like circles, uh, which are our collaboratives, which um, we'll probably talk about in a minute, but also like ways that we work and ways that we work with our partners. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's a good question to talk about when it comes to how equity is not just a handout for, you know, first of all, Communities of color in this country, especially Black people, um, there's nothing you could do 
when it comes to quote unquote handing out that we aren't owed. So let me just say that. Mm -hmm. um, so there is no handout. The work has been done. Mm -hmm. The work is still being done. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, without being political, the work is still being done. And so, uh, not paying payment, but like retribution or like for that work. What very and deserve. So let me just say that. So there is no handout. The work, the work has been done. Um, but I think that uh, as we lift, you know, we see that as we lift, you know, I was just talking before about like, as you educate women around the world, you are educating communities, you're lifting up communities. And so if we lift as we climb, if we're all lifting as we climb, uh, then we are making sure that we are lifting up the community. You know, there's a lot of things in the news right now about um, student loan forgiveness, for example. And a lot of economists have said, and there have been studies that have come out that have said, if we, you know, forgive student loan debt or whatever, that it could actually lift the lift the economy. Now, whether or not folks believe that, you know, is their own opinion. But there have been a lot of studies that have come out that have said, from a, from an economist economist and financial standpoint, that that potentially could help and boost the economy of our country. So that's just one of the ways I think that uh, shows how lifting other people up out of poverty, out of disenfranchisement, hopefully out of oppression uh, in a lot of different systems in this country uh, and in the world uh, can be beneficial for all of us, for all of our communities and all of our society, you know, our various societies globally. And so I think we need to do more. And I think PSC does a very good job of shining the light on the fact that we need to do more uh, you know, um, uh, lifting as we climb as a community. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me that there are so many millionaires that are American citizens or that you know, are American, born American, but there are also so many poor people and there's so much poverty. So there's so much poverty in America, but there's also so many people with so much money. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, don't get me to lie, I'm not gonna you know, say the percentages, but you can see like the gap is insane. Um, and so like people have done studies or articles about like, if you divide up such and such as money, how many people you could feed or how you could lift the community out of poverty. Uh, and so how are we utilizing our resources? Uh, and how are we giving back and lifting other people up as we climb, um, I think is really important. And so when it comes to equity, um, it is important for us to remember that uh, equity helps all of us and rights a lot of the historical wrongs uh, in this country that, and in writing those wrongs or in, maybe not fully writing them, but in like making up for those wrongs, for lack of a better term, uh, we can potentially like build a better community for all of us um, in the United States and, and, around, the, and around the world. Dope, 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 dope. So let's go another layer deeper. How or, or what can uh, youth do to join in on the fight for just energy? That's a great question. So we have a lot of, first of all, we have a lot of amazing partners in the Just Energy Circle. The Just Energy Circle is our collaborative of organizations that work on energy equity. Uh, chiefly the Just Energy Circle currently is like so organizations surrounding the Atlanta metro area. However, we've been looking at creating Just Energy Circle like satellite collaboratives in other parts of the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I know that PSE would love to start thinking about Just Energy Circles in other states. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I think that could be really, really, really dope. Uh, so with that being said, you know, one way that young people can join the just, join the work is Just Energy Circle. Uh, 
I don't think we have any, you know, I manage the Just Energy Circle for PSC, and I don't think we have any organizations that are like youth led or youth mm -hmm. powered. Mm -hmm. uh, so if there are organizations out there that, you know, work in Georgia and are interested in energy equity and like climate justice and environmental justice, uh, I would encourage you to get in touch with the Partnership for Southern Equity and reach out to us. I'd love to have you all a part of the Just Energy Circle and being a, the youth voice on that space. Yes. The other way that people can get involved or young people can get involved uh, with the Just Energy work is uh, we have a seven month leadership development, um, seven month leadership development academy called the Just Energy Academy uh, that works on ed educating people on um, energy equity and, and climate justice excuse me, an environmental justice that like runs the gamut. So we spend seven months, one Saturday a month, educating people on those issues. And we have had quite a few or a surge of young people in that have joined the Just Energy Academy. We have a few young people that were a part of it in 20, 2019. We have a few more part of it in 2020. So that's super exciting. And I know like the one is that we continue to increase the amount of young people that are involved in the Just Energy Academy. So if you're interested in that, uh, we are finishing up Academy 2020, or Cohort 2020 right now. They have two more months, uh, but we will be opening up the application for Just Energy Academy in you know, October, late October, I think. And uh, we'll be accepting cohort applications for 2021 cohort, which I'm excited the PSC is going to have another one uh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's powerful work. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Okay. All right. So let's see here. Are there any things uh, that you would like to announce as events or is there any other things that we didn't touch on that you would like to touch on um, before we close out here? Uh, let me think. Uh, well, I know that the youth work at PSC is going really well, and I'm excited about that work. Uh, and the summer chat and choose, summer Southeast youth chat and choose are continuing next month. We had a really fantastic one in June, and they're continuing next month. Uh, in July, it's the second week, second Wednesday of June, July, and August. Mm -hmm. So at 5.30 on July 8th is the second installment and that's the one where we're going to talk about action where we've been talking about uh coronavirus and also now we've been talking about the racial uprising it's been a cool and cool conversation to like see how both those things are related mm -hmm. and we have a, had a lot of great feedback last time so like that's really exciting so july 8th if you're interested in learning more about how to join that conversation keep that same energy.org um, and then the, we had like social justice, uh, Sunday chat and chills. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we're calling them chat and chills now with Marsha. Okay. 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 Yeah. That's like the new name, uh, where folks, where we've been able, uh, showing documentaries, uh, over zoom, like doing a watch party. That's cool. And so, um, sorry. and so we've been able to, um, have folks join us for those watch parties, which is really great. And then the movie on Tuesday almost made me cry. Oh, did it? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was good. It was, it was, it was powerful. Um, um, is there like a discussion afterwards, Mike, or is it just the movie? So it's a panel. Um, oh, cool. Dr. McLean um, and a few other people uh, spoke about environmental racism and how real it is um, and yeah. how people, and showing this web of interconnectivity between how energy impacts health and how health impacts economics and how economics impacts. So it's just like this really cohesive uh, project. So please join. Let's go. Yes, please join those. The last Summer Southeast Youth Chat and Chew is in August. I think it's the 12th. And that will feature Nathaniel Smith, our CEO. And uh, so we're excited about that. So I think, yeah, those are probably the, the two things I wanted to mention. Um, and then like exciting things coming up with the youth stuff this fall, exciting things coming up with the youth stuff in the spring. So mm -hmm. just stay tuned, just stay updated. Mm -hmm. And 
go to keep that same energy.org to join the mailing list because that's where we'll send out all that information. Yes. So thank you, Erica. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for thank the you. wonderful introductory dynamic conversation. Um, I hope you all enjoyed. I want you to ask and pose some really good questions and she's going to do her best to respond to all of them. Thanks. Bye. Bye.